obviously. So if you're ever downtown, you want to come and uh, play foosball or uh, have lunch, talk about Android, you know, just hit me up. Love to, uh, love to nerd out in OTR with, with some people. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, here's a few ways. Uh, easiest way, Android-wise, is the Sensei Tech Slack in the Android channel. If, uh, if you uh, want to talk about Android, I troll the Sensei Tech Slack. So feel free to hit me up anytime. Um, or email, Twitter, other ways to get a hold of me. So story time. And our director of technology, Ben, is in the back, by the way. Thanks for coming, Ben. Appreciate it. Out to support all of us. So um, basically, um, we had a 2.0 version, which had been uh, around for a while. And uh, we started to look into what can we do to improve our users' experience as much as possible. So we started to um, build out a 3.0 version. And in that, I essentially started to do architectural spikes to figure out what technologies would allow us to build the design that was presented as best as possible. Just kind of, if you don't know Tor Monster, you don't know Paul, Paul is our chief creative. He is, in my opinion, the best designer in Cincinnati, if not one of the best in the country. He's phenomenal. Uh, you probably know his work. He did the Startup Sensei logo, uh, as well as lots of other stuff I'm sure you've seen. And a TEDx talk about uh, screen time with kids, um, which I've, if you want to link to, just hit me up after uh, the presentation. But Paul also pushes the boundaries of design. He creates these incredibly complex, rich designs that, in a lot of cases, are really difficult to pull off on Android. Uh, there's a lot of custom views, there's a lot of canvas going on, there's a lot of uh, everything has rounded corners, so everything has background drawable XML and, and lots and lots of details. So uh, Paul is incredible, uh, but he also pushes the boundaries. So because of that, these are all the things I did in our architectural spike over about four to six weeks. Tried everything, like just wanted to, just did tiny little bits of the most complicated pieces of our app and just saw, like, is MVP the best way to approach this? Is RxJava going to benefit it? Dagger 1 or Dagger 2, you've got people in both camps uh, that are very opinionated about Dagger 1 or Dagger 2 being better or worse or whatever. Uh, Realm is really hot. Content providers uh, are not hot at all, but uh, are extremely reliable. So, uh, and also arguably the most flexible. So um, went through all these things uh, and uh, in the end found that um, for our uh, 3.0 version, I'm using MVVM pattern with data binding. And Dagger 2, Retrolanda, still using content providers just because they're super safe and they provide you, <laughs> thanks, uh, they provide you the most flexibility. Um, there's nothing that you can't do with a content provider, uh, but there's lots of things that you can't do with Realm. So just something to consider. Um, all the boilerplate might be worth it. Again, it, it depends on your individual situation. Uh, Roboelectric, Espresso, and we vectorized everything. So um, just about everything is an SVG, or in our case, a vector drawable. So um, that helped tremendously. So why data binding? I mean, think of all the great things you've heard from people in the Android community about data binding. Everyone loves it, right? I mean, Jake Wharton said that data binding is the fragments of 2015. I mean, fragments are good, right? I mean, everyone loves fragments. No? OK. Who's Jake Warden anyway? I mean, he's probably a nobody. Um, great article you can read about how you can go wrong with a new data binding API. Our great Reddit post here that says, it's been almost a year since the Google data binding library was announced. Is anyone using it extensively or at all? Well, this guy. So. I think there's a lot of confusion around what data binding can provide to your project. Um, it's not only, I mean, you don't have to go full-blown MVVM to use data binding. You can pull in just pieces of it really easily. You can use it as a butter knife replacement. You can use it for MVVM. You can also pull it in for these uh, little things called uh, binding adapters, which are phenomenal and really powerful. Um, it also is really nice to know that data binding if you have a value on a model and a property you're calling and you bind to it, it will not throw a null pointer exception. So that will clean up your code tremendously if you've got a case where you've got a model that 
could potentially have several null properties, you don't necessarily have to write all that null checking code that we hate as Java developers. So rather than uh, bore you guys with more slides, I just wanted to kind of give you a, a, an introduction and then just dry, dive into uh, live code because that always works perfectly well, particularly when I'm half blind and I can't even see. First thing I probably should do is, bear with me guys, change this from dark yellow, even though I love dark yellow, to something that is probably a little more legible. Well, shit. <laughs> that didn't ex work like I expected. Oh, are you still using Eclipse? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, after, I'll fire up Android Studio here again, see if we, uh, we get the background like we should. Well, it's still dark. Can everybody see that? That's really what matters. Blow the font up a little bit. Control Command Plus doesn't really work there. Is the presentation mode? Yeah, just go to the interview mode. Ah, okay. Cool. Oh, nice. Okay. Very nice. That's uh, that's helpful. So, um, all right. So first, I before I do that, I probably should fire up the uh, the uh, project here that I actually should. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So um, basically, I just wanted to demonstrate data binding as a replacement for butter knife. So you could, um, if you just want to use data binding in your project and you, for instance, maybe one of your project requirements is that you don't use third-party dependencies. Well, data binding is technically part of the uh, Build Gradle plugin in Android now, so you're not veering away from the Google path. All right. I think I'm going to have to exit real quick here, open up what I need to open up. Here we go. Thank you for bearing with me here as I blindly. All right, so this is basically just the um, empty activity or blank activity rather in Android Studio being replaced with butter knife. So we've got to bind to the uh, toolbar. We initiate butter knife here in the onCreate method, and uh, we bind and onclick to the fab that's included in the basic activity. So it's pretty basic stuff. You're familiar with butter knife. I, I hope everyone's know, everyone here has used butter knife before. It's a great tool if you haven't. How would we do this with the data binding framework? Well, I'm going to live code here. Probably a terrible idea. And I'm going to just fire up a new project and show you what it's like to do some data binding. So I'm going to call this data binding knife. Since we're just using this to I'm going to fire up with a basic activity. And once the project comes up, we're going to uh, modify our um, Gradle to include uh, data binding. So all we have to do is open up our application specific Gradle and in, in uh, camel case, type in data binding and just type enabled equals true. That's it. Yeah. So let me solve this because I'm having trouble switching modes. I'm just going to blow my font up a little bit so I can still see my project menu. I haven't learned all the... Uh, how about... I'm 
Maybe there's a better way. There probably is. All right, so I guess you can see that. So basically, this is all that's required. Command one. Yeah. Ah, cool. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. So um, that's all you have to do to get data binding. You just basically put in an additional attribute in your Android for data binding equals true. So now there's this magic process that's going on in the IDE. It's very similar to what Dagger 2 does, if you're familiar with Dagger 2, where essentially um, all of the data binding, all data binding does is it takes your bindings and it converts it to all the fine view by ID code that you normally would write normally. So it, it's basically a code generation tool. So it's generating all that code that you would normally write by hand. So just to kind of, let's go into our main activity. <coughs> And let's just refactor this a little bit for data binding. So the first thing that I need to do is uh, generate a binding. So to do that, you open up the layout file. And the layout file has to change very slightly to enable data binding. So the first thing you need to do is have a root level tag just called layout. So you wrap your entire markup in the layout tag. Now, just like with um, any layout file, you need a root layout. So within layout, I've got coordinator layout is our root in this particular case. Second thing we need is a data attribute. And then from there, you grab your uh, namespaces, and you just put them at the top level in layout. So now we're set up for data binding. Now if we jump back in our main activity, Android Studio is going to have generated a class called activity main binding. This irritates me. So I end up putting a little extra markup on every single one of my layouts. So because we follow the standard, I don't know if it's recommended, but we follow the standard naming convention of what your layout file is underscore the name of it. So in our case, we're doing activity underscore main and because of that naming convention, the uh, data binding framework wants to name it activity main binding. I don't like that it's called that. I want to call it main activity binding or main binding even. So to do that, you go back to your layout file, jeez, in text mode. There we go. And you just give it a class. And I'm just going to call this main binding. So after doing that, we go back to our file here, and now main binding magically appears. So main binding, which I usually would just call binding, is equal to, now how do we get the binding? How do we inflate the binding? Well, there's just a small change here. In onCreate, when you're used to calling set content view, you call data binding util dot set content view. And the argument is, first you get the context, so in this case the activity, and then the activity that you want to expand with a data binding utility. So by doing that, I now have this magic binding class that has all my stuff in it, and I get strongly typed references to anything that has an ID. So instead of using um, Butterknife, where you basically call bind and you give it an ID, you can basically just inspect your binding. And here's the other be added benefit to the binding. Whereas Butterknife, you have to pass it an ID. And if you pass it the wrong ID, I don't know if you've accidentally passed the wrong r.id to a bind command, but what happens is when that activity inflates, your app crashes. Now, with binding, because it knows the context, all of these suggestions you see are strongly typed, and it's not going to suggest an ID that doesn't exist in the layout that I'm mapping to. So you're never going to get that case where with Butterknife you get the exception where you accidentally typed your, um, your edit text main. Instead of edit, te edit text main, you chose edit text secondary, which happens to be on another layout. You know? So um, following that, let's refactor this code a little bit to, uh, to clean it up. So obviously the first thing that uh, we can blow away is this, this find view by ID to the fab. 
I don't need that anymore. But we still need to set our on click listener. Well, we could just do binding.fab, and now we've replaced that, that find by ID. So if you're looking at, uh, and we do the same with the toolbar here as well. So instead of finding the toolbar by name, we can reach into the binding. Make sure you do it after <laughs> you uh, set your content uh, view. You can reach in there and, and grab the toolbar too. So um, in a lot of my activities, I find that instead of using butter knife, I'm, um, I've got a, a method that's called after the binding occurs that actually wires up all of my events with Lambda expressions. So, and that's, it's a, it's a preference. I mean, there's certain things that uh, butter knife certainly does well, but just because you're using data binding doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use butter knife as well. So there's certain things that you might feel as a team read syntactically better. Like for instance, the at on click annotation. You can still use that and use data binding if you want. It's, it, just using data binding does not mean that you can't use butter knife as well. So just something to consider and it's part of the native tool, tool chain. So there's a, there's a little bit, but I also wanted to show you all the other cool stuff you can do with data binding. So I created a little project called Space Heroes, because I like space. <laughs> so, and what nerd doesn't? I mean, so um, this app is, uh, is basically trying to demonstrate all the stuff that I think is important or the things that data binding brings to the table that could be helpful to you. So I'll just fire this app up here in an emulator. and make it real big. I'll just kind of show you an overview of what the app does. Honestly, I'm a little ashamed of it because I have such reverence for our space program. I don't feel that the app that I built in two hours in the twilight morning last night does any justice to space heroes whatsoever. So, There we go. I'm using the Android Studio 2.0 emulators. And for some reason, it is normally works really well. But right now, it's super slow, obviously, because I'm presenting. It's a rule. All right, so I'm going to fire up Space Heroes and just kind of give you a, uh, a rundown. So it's got this terrible UI that I built, because I'm not a designer, that has this really cool NASA font at the top that says Space Legends. It's got a, a button that launches an astronaut activity, a spacecraft activity, an activity that will allow you to send a message to Mars. And then this really cool fab down here with a rocket on it. Well, when you click on the rocket fab, it shows you a GIF of a rocket launch, which is selected at random. Somewhat random. <laughs> Somewhat random. <laughs> All right, fourth time is a charm. No, guess not. Okay. Well, yeah. And then if you uh, go to astronauts, it uh, loads a recycler view with uh, a few different different astronauts. And Jesus, uh, it's operating slow. Okay. And then spacecraft just uh, loads a uh, recycler view with uh, with a few different images of different spacecraft from the the various space programs. So nothing super exciting, but I just kind of want to show you a few of the things that data binding can do that are really hel helpful. Um, and we already kind of went over the, um, geez, my vision is terrible, guys. I apologize. There we go. So uh, just a little bit of the breakdown of the app. Um, we've got a few activities. We've got an astronaut activity, which is the listing of astronauts. We've got a launch activity, which is the, the GIF viewer. The main, which um, shows you the buttons and the, the NASA font, as, long, uh, as well as the fab. Message, send a message to Mars, uh, which I didn't show that. This is kind of, this is a terrible use case for this, but the message to Mars is an example of the new two-way binding that is available 
in um, the Gradle plugin 2.1.0 beta. So it's for whatever reason, if you're running the release version of Android Studio 2.0, this feature is not included. But they're building it, and it's a strange situation. But two-way binding is coming, and if you're planning on potentially bringing data binding into one of your projects, then um, it's something you could potentially plan for as a benefit. So basically all this does is you, as you type, it updates another text view because the view model behind the scenes is operating on a two-way binding. So as I'm, as I'm typing the message, it's updating a variable and then notifying the view model that an up, a uh, change has occurred. So if you've worked with, um, if you've worked with uh, MVVM type frameworks like um, Microsoft's um, WPF or Silverlight, and not that anybody uses that anymore, but um, the two-way model and the way you do notify changed or notify property changed is something that .NET developers will know. So potentially if you're, if you're a .NET shop and you're looking to push your app towards an Android direction, data binding is something you could potentially use to sell that in that you have two-way bindings, you've got model view view model, you've got notify property changed. It's a mindset that, that those developers will easily adapt to. So back to code. Back to stumbling through my code here as I try to see. So um, we've got a few things. We've got various activities. We've got a couple adapters for the recycler views. We've got some model classes, which are mostly just POJOs. Some repositories, which um, in this case just bring back hard-coded hard data. Again, not an app that the NASA would be proud of. And then uh, we've got custom binders, which in my opinion, if there's one reason that I could give you to pull data binding into your project, regardless of whether you're MVP, MVVM, custom bindings are super cool and ultra helpful. So um, we'll get to that. So pretty boring stuff here, really. Um, just using binding as a, um, as a replacement for butter knife. And uh, setting up view models. So one thing that's, that's, that's really interesting is um, looking at adapters. If you look at the adapter, this is the astronaut adapter. So essentially, the image view, which loads the uh, image of the astronaut and the name of the astronaut side by side in the recycler view, um, is going through this adapter. And as you can see, like if you're familiar with recycler views and the view holder pattern, you're probably wondering like where's all the the code where you get the IDs and then I take the model and I set it and there's all this boilerplate that occurs. But instead of that, in my view holder you see I've got a binding and then I call data binding util bind and that's it. There's no wiring up code. Like where is all that code? And the truth in what it actually is is I've got a view model, or I just got the astronaut model, which has the image and the name. And then over in our layout, I've got this item astronaut, which takes an astronaut and then just binds the values. So the text property is bound to name. And this is where the custom bindings come in. This is, this is really handy stuff is I've got this custom binding I've created called image URL, which takes the, which is bound to the image property on the astronaut. So what is image URL and what does it do? This is the custom bindings. So what image URL, what load image is doing, whenever I, I basically bind a property to image URL in my XML, First, it assumes that it has to be on an image view, so it's taking an image view, and the second property, or what I've actually set that to, is a string property called image URL, and then it takes those and it does Picasso in the background. So all of those situations where you have to, in your code, write Picasso out or Glide or whatever image you're, you're, you've chosen for your project, all those strung throughout your code, you can replace with an image URL pro, uh, property. Anytime you have an image view you need to load an image into, you don't have to have Picasso strung throughout your entire project. The other thing that's really handy there is all those other things that you have to write out, because if you've used Picasso before and you've got these chain builder methods, 
or you're setting placeholders, you're setting up failure options, you can set all that stuff here in one place. And then if you need to, let's just say hypothetically, and this actually happened on our project, is you're running Picasso and then somebody tells you, well, you should consider Glide because Glide uses a lot less memory. Well, I ripped out Picasso from my project and replaced it with Glide just because the benchmarks were that in our app, it reduced overhead by 8 to 10 megs on memory. So it was worth it. But instead of going through my entire project and finding everywhere that I referenced Glide or Picasso, I just had to go to this one spot. So that's pretty handy. The other thing that we've got up here, which is the, I mean, this to me is, like, keep in mind, like, you don't have to use model view, view model. You don't have to um, adopt all of the things that data binding gives you. If you want to use custom bindings, you just need to data binding enables it equals true, put that in your Gradle file, and then you don't even have to have a model. Like, you can just set it to a, st a string property. So, this one's really handy. Set font. Who hates, who hates loading fonts in Android? I, everyone. I mean, it's, it's such a pain. And um, in our 2.0 version, I actually ripped out because we had typeface setting code all over. And how, how ugly is it to look through your activities and just see strings of typeface code? It's agonizing to see how many lines of code it takes on Android to set a typeface. And the worst part of it, is that in your XML, you can set the size, the color, all kinds of stuff, but you have to go in and you have to write Java code to set your, your typeface. So I know there is um, there's a, a very popular third-party library called Calligraphy, which its aim is to essentially allow you to put XML that will create custom fonts or bind typefaces. We use that on our project, and we found that um, we were running a t into tons of OOMs out of memories. Uh, Crashlytics was just showing tons of stuff, and it was bubbling up. The stack traces were bubbling up from calligraphy. So we ended up having to rip out calligraphy and go back to setting typeface everywhere. So being able to just take your view and set the typeface right there in one spot, and then what that looks like in XML is this, app font NASA TTF. So what that's going to do is go to my resources, pull out the asset manager, and inflate NASA TTF anywhere I put that tag. So any, on any view I put app font, it's going to set the typeface to that custom. So um, our app has tons of typefaces. So this is incredibly useful. So um, custom binders, this is another thing that uh, the really cool thing about custom binders is that um, if you're finding that data binding isn't doing something that you need to do regularly in, view, in views, you can write your own. So for, the, uh, for this particular play project that I, that I threw together for this presentation, uh, I found that the GIF image view, which is just a third-party library that I found off of Android Arsenal that was popular um, to load GIFs into an image view, it had, it had problems doing data binding. Basically, if I just set the source property to the, the GIF resource, it would fail. But if I did it in Java, it would work. So I just took that Java that was working, dropped it into a custom binder, and now all I have to do is set that property, the GIF property, which is on the activity launch. Just set it to the property on my model. And then as soon as it loads up, it just starts playing the GIF. So that, I mean, if there's one thing you pull from data binding, like, that's it right there. Custom binding is incredibly powerful and saves a ton of time. The only other thing that um, I would suggest is if you have code, like a lot of our designs um, are not just simple binary things. Like for instance, like we've got a rounded button or a rounded text view, and then the background changes, the border changes whenever it's focused, or the font changes whenever it's invalid, or 
there's an error message that appears. There's all these state related things that you need to keep track of to update your design. Just as an example, this is just kind of a quick example I was working on today. So this particular box here this, that says remember me, it's got a, uh, if you're looking at this at Android, you're thinking, well, you've got a background drawable and the solid is white and the border is some kind of purple. Well, what if your designer wants that border to change? Well, shoot, now you've got to create another drawable file that has a different shade of purple as the border. And then in your Java code, you've got to get that button or that container and then change its background. And you've got to figure out, are you using context compat? Are you using app compat? Or you know, what are you using to inflate your view? There's, it feels like every time there's a change to the support library, there is some other kind of way to get colors, <laughs> get resources, get drawables, depending on what you're trying to do. And on top of that, like what if you're this draw this uh, color tint changes as well. Well, and the uh, font color changes. So I've got one piece of data, a Boolean, remember. And I have to change the drawable background. I have to change the tint on this, and I have to change the color on the font based on one piece of data. So what does that code look like? Well. I think everyone who's worked with Android is probably familiar with how it looks. With how it looks in um, Java. In this case, I've commented a good chunk of it out just to, uh, just to demonstrate. So for the remember, Whenever I click it, let's just assume I'm using butter knife with a, a model view presenter type pattern. That simple code looks like this. So if you're using MVP, which everyone in the Android community is really hot on right now, um, your presenter is essentially storing your model data. Your, if you're following the passive view form of MVP. So your activity isn't storing any data, particularly because if you rotate the screen, you've got to figure out a way to get that state back in, right? So you're using your presenter to store state, either on some model that it queries from a repository or something along those lines. So in this particular method, whenever I click on the button for remember, I've got to see does my presenter have, what's the value on the presenter? Is it true or false? I need to set the presenter and update it to the inverse of that. Now, depending on whether remember is true or false, I need to set the background drawable, the text color, the image resource, and the color filter, which color filter is tint because it's different. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a impedance mismatch between what Android calls it in Java and what they call it in XML. So, there's this cognitive load that occurs when you're in Java that doesn't occur in the XML. And on top of that, do you use context compat to get the color? Like, how do you get the color? Or do you parse it out from a string? Like, there's all these different options. Well, that's how that works in Java. But if you're using data binding, and you've got a view model, basically this view model can extend base observable. And basically what that means is it creates a reactive type pattern that whenever you notify change, it runs a digest loop. And that digest loop just sees in your XML, like, is there something on screen that needs to be updated? So I've just got this one property, remember me, and then getters and setters. One gotcha with data binding is you have to follow Java bean syntax. Otherwise, it won't, it won't compile. And when it fails to compile, I have to give Google credit for this. They tell you, you have to follow Java Bean syntax. Exactly. I mean, that's the error message. So getters and setters. 
And that's why there's this really annoying method that really bothers me, which you have to is named is remember me. Because it's Java bean syntax. So we've got this simple view model which I've bound in a login activity. So this is pretty simple. I've just got um, the binding is inflated. Then I create a new instance of the view model and I set the model on the binding. Now if we go into the um, layout file, instead of having those lines and lines of Java, we look at rem remember me here and we just have these really simple ternary operators that look at the model and say, what's remember me? If it's true, then grab this drawable. If it's false, then grab this drawable. Same with the image view. So I actually set the image view tint, the background drawable, and the color of the text with one simple Boolean. So if you've got design that changes dramatically based on one criteria, you don't have to query and grab all of these pieces off of your view and then update them one at a time. You just bind it and then you can refer it directly to the resource. Now, a lot of people feel that this is a disadvantage. By the way, this is also supposed to work, um, but two-way data binding is kind of new in that uh, if edit username is focused, then I can change the background drawable depending on whether it has focus or not. So a lot simpler than attaching a listener and querying through all your views and updating them one at a time. Now this is if you have complicated designs that change like it, based on state. In our case we have um, our, our borders, our text view borders change, our co text color changes, uh, sometimes the font changes. And um, based on that particular use case, I found that data binding was, you know, we built out an, a, an architectural spike with um, MVP and with, with, uh, with data binding and found that data binding with our designs made it tremendously easier. Now that doesn't necessarily preclude, like you can actually run MVP and data binding. Like for whatever reason, I think there's this mentality in the community that you're either team MVP or you're either team MVVM. And if you're, if you're data binding, then you're absolutely MVVM. And that is not the case. Like you can pull in data binding and just use it in place of butter knife if you want. You can pull in data binding and butter knife together and just use them where they make sense. You can pull in data binding and just use the custom binding binders aspect of it. To, if you want to use it only for fonts, you can do that. So basically, what I'm trying to say is there's no reason not to have data binding enabled true in your project. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt anything. That's basically all I've got. Anybody have any, that was pretty quick. Anybody have any questions? Yes, it does now. Uh, if, if, if you tried uh, data binding previously, um, back before um, they integrated it into the Android uh, Gradle plugin, it did not work and you had to just kind of rely on it. But now, um, anytime you reference your model, it will, you know, if I start typing, it will actually suggest the properties that are available to me. Uh, and you know, if I hit con uh, control space, then it'll make those suggestions as well. Remember, Mr. Well, yeah, so yeah, IntelliSense works now, uh, and that's great. But if you started using data binding when it first came out, which uh, t we've basically, we've been working on the project, we've been, our current project has been running for several months. So we've went through the pain of data binding being its own plugin, which is what it started out as, and then Google moving it into the um, Android Gradle plugin, and um, it's there's some things that you know have, it's been kind of a rough at times because it's you know a newer technology. I think they still consider it beta, uh, but we know how long things are in beta. Google typically 
pretty long. Uh, but uh, yeah, the um, IntelliSense works great now, and that includes um, the stable. So you don't have to run Android Studio 2.1 to get the IntelliSense. It's part of 2.0 now. So. Do you know if like any rumors of when 2A bindings would be available? It's actually well, I mean, you can technically all you need to run 2A binding. Which, by the way, I, I didn't mention this piece, but. Um, in the NASA project that I had, the way you do two-way binding is you just basically preface it with, a, with an equal. There we go, space heroes. So in this project, message, that's what it is. So you can see that um, on the edit text, I'm actually bi I'm doing a two-way binding, and all I have to do to say that it's two-way is just put an equal there. Now it's kind of funny if you actually look at the generated code that the data binding program is generating. It's generating an edit an on-text change listener. That's all it's doing. But you don't have to actually write it. You know that nasty listener code that is. Bo mostly boilerplate and not um, fun to, to write. Just by putting a little equal sign in between your at sign and your bracket tells two-way bindings that you, uh, you want a listener essentially to update the value constantly in the background. But um, the only thing you need right now to answer your question is you need the, the Gradle plugin 2.1. If you're running 2.0.0, it's not there. I'm not sure exactly why that is. Um, the decision to include data binding as part of the Gradle plugin is is kind of it's it's a little odd in that technically two-way data binding, I guess, is it should be. I mean, it seems to work fine. I don't know if it's considered a beta state, and and that's why they're they've included it in the 2.1 uh, and not the 2.0 Gradle plugin, but. Um, if you change your Gradle plugin to 2.1, you'll have two-way data binding. But I would assume it would come out with the Android Studio 2.1 release as a release uh, level product. So yeah. What you got? How do they just play with uh, loaders? What's that? Loaders. Oh, loaders. You know, well to be honest with you, I have not tried. Um, and just the reason being is that at the time when we uh, were doing our architectural spike, there was a fundamental problem with loaders and fragments. Like, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, I, I believe it's resolved now. So, it'd be interesting to find out. <laughs> yeah. But if it works with Recycler View, I, I don't know why it wouldn't. Yeah. Right, that's that is true. You you bind to a model, and the way that that we're handling it is, um, um, we use a repository pattern. So, um, and then with Dagger two, we inject a singleton repository into anything that needs it, and the repository handles all of the querying through the content provider. You know, so um, the way I've structured the app, it you know n the app isn't directly working with a cursor in any case, and. I've made a good effort to take cursors out of activities and fragments. Like I don't feel like that should, that those two should not meet in my mind. And I don't, I, loaders, it feels tightly coupled, so I kind of strayed away from it for that reason. Yeah, not that it's not that it's bad or anything. It probably works for your case just fine. But I'd be interested to know if you want to try it. <laughs> I'd be to try. This looks great. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, like. If you have a lot of fonts, like our app has lots of custom typefaces. Um, I think we have 20 or 30, no exaggeration, 20 or 30 different typefaces. Once you break down like book and light and you know, medium and display medium and display bold and um, not having to write typeface uh, glue logic is worth bringing, the, bringing it into your project alone, I think. So, and the funny thing is, is when you look at the data binding generated code, 
because you can actually jump jump into the generated folder and see. I think it's an intermediate, but the date the, the 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 font code is just it's just doing typeface stuff. All the stuff that you normally are writing in Java anyway. Uh, you just don't have to write it over and over and over again. So yeah. You know, it's kind of actually, data binding adds no methods to the dex count at all. Um, it's because it's just, it's generating the code that you would have had to generate, that you would have written anyway. Um, and that's one of the arguments that I, I thought about presenting tonight was that, hey, you don't have to bring in, and I think Butterknife has 234 methods. It's super small. But the thing that happened, which was fascinating to me, is when I ran Butterknife, and uh, data binding side by side for a simple project, the method count was exactly the same. So even though Butterknife was adding 234 methods, it seems like there is a net, you know, and the truth is, is like everyone points to the dex count limit, and I think that, tr that in reality, you're either gonna hit the dex count limit and have to multi-dex or use ProGuard heavily or not, like depending on your app size. Like, and if you're already there, just, just do it. Like, you know, like once you're at 64,000 methods, just multi-dex your app or ProGuard because you're going to hit it. Like our, our full-blown app, I think, has 60 or 70 activities, and we hit the dex count long. You know, like there's, there's nothing, I mean, there's not much you can do once your app hits a certain size. So I, I don't know, like I don't feel like that's a... I, Lowering the dex count and using data binding is, I don't know that it's, you know, you're, you're really going to reduce your method count enough to, to make a difference. Yeah. What you got? Since you said that no one seems to be using it, do you know why? See, this all sounds so dumb. Like, I don't know why a lot of people would be using it. Well, I think, honestly, the big thing is that, um, I think the Android community in particular, like um, Ben and I come from the Ruby community, and the Ruby community is very open to new ideas overall. Uh, very accepting, you know, very friendly. Like if you go to a, a Ruby meetup, they're very encouraging to outsiders. I think the Android community is a lot more grumpier. <laughs> no, it's, it's just, well, it's, so once, and it's also an opportunity cost, right? Like if I choose data binding, then, you know, would the app have been better if I had chosen this other shiny thing that everyone else is using? You know, and um, I think there's a, there's a narrative that I see going on in, you know, this Android subreddit, um, the Android community overall, that, hey, you know, if you're not using RxJava and uh, MVP, then you're not a real Android developer. You know, I, I feel like there's this, this attitude that fragments are bad. Well, what are you using? Are you using fragments? Who, who, who here is using fragments? Who hates fragments? <laughs> you know, like the, the life cycle on fragments uh, is insane. And uh, God help you if you try to nest fragments. You know, like that's where things get really nasty. Um, but at the same time, like I, I continue to use fragments because uh, if you pull in a uh, view pager, or if you are using um, uh, the nav, the Android standard nav, it lends itself to fragments. So it's it's the right tool for the job. And if you've ever used MVP, like people are really hot on MVP right now. That hey, and it's a great pattern. Model view presenter is a great pattern. But if you've ever really got into it, the amount of interface class explosion you get when you start to do MVP and the amount of work that you have to do before you do the work that you want to do, I mean, that was the main reason that I, I strayed away from MVP for, for our project was because, like, you create your activity and you create your presenter and then you wire up your presenter and then you create an interface for your view and you create an interface for your presenter and you have them talk back and forth. And the amount of stuff you have to do just to get working is enormous. And I think 
I'm not trying to say MVP is a bad pattern. I think it's a great pattern. It, it lends to the most testable um, that you can achieve. But there's also a lot of testing you can do with MVVM. And the data binding, I mean, that was the big differentiator. I thought not only was it easier to accomplish the designs that I needed to accomplish, but I didn't have to write interface classes for everything. So the amount of productivity I had with data binding, I felt, was much better than it was with uh, MVP. But again, like, I think the reality is, is like, what is the right answer? Like, should I use fragments? Should I use MVP? Should I use MVVM? The right answer from any smart developer is it depends. What is your position? What is your situation? Look at your data. Like, what API level should I support? It depends. Like, look at your user base. Like, 80% of your users are on Lollipop? Well, try to, you know, try to kick the uh, KitKat people out. You know, like, it's, it all depends. Like, I, th I think the reality is, is that some very prominent people, to answer your question, uh, some very prominent people like Jake Wharton come out and they say, data binding is garbage. And then everyone who's using all of Jake's, including me, see that, and then they, they don't even consider it. They don't even try it because Jake said it was bad. And like the yeah. and there's, a, there's a whole bunch of other libraries too that do very similar things um, about extracting away uh, some of your code and that sort of thing. Um, there, are, there are libraries from uh, like Hannah Storfman uh, who has a bunch of stuff that, um, like some of the boilerplate stuff that you were doing, he has a lot of libraries that huh. also Yeah, that's a good point. There's a lot of different ways to, I mean, and honestly, none of them, but everyone wants to say that their way is the right one. When in reality, it's, there's all kinds of ways to accomplish this, the same problem. I mean, like a lot of people look at data binding, and one of the big criticisms is, is that, well, you're putting logic in your view. And? Like, why is that bad? Like, you know, that's the follow-up question. Like, why is putting, well, why is putting a ternary operator in my view a bad thing? I already have to look at my XML to determine what my font size is. There's already logic. There's, in my mind, there's already business decisions that are in XML. Like somebody decided that your font was supposed to be this and your color was supposed to be this. So you're already looking at it. And, now, and the great thing about data binding is it doesn't allow you to do, like the, the, the expression language you have available to you is very limited. If you try to do anything super fancy in XML, it's not going to work. So I think you know, Google probably learned from Angular, uh, if you've ever used that framework, that they shouldn't allow you to do that much. But um, it's, um, it's really powerful. I, I don't know. You had a question? Uh, I was just really going to comment. Or a comment. Oh, yeah. The on the Square blog is, is kind of gold, and I think the Square does put out amazing things in the community. But if you listen to Jake Horton and, and hear him on podcasts, you know, even he will say, you know, the things we put out there, you should make sure that they're the right solution for your project and your unique piece. You know, don't just download you know, our dependencies and pull them in your project and just use them. You need to make sure that they, they fit your particular problem. Yeah. Yeah. Said data binding was awesome. Everybody would dip, would, would uh, ditch butter knife to go to data binding. I'd be so interested to see that. To really have to, like, I think you guys did an amazing job. I like, architectural spike. Look at all these patterns and, and which which one fits best for short life. Right. You know, you know, we work at Kroger. Not all that stuff would fit into you know our legacy. So we've got to make sure that these new things fit in well with the people you have. Yeah, that's very, and RxJava, I think, is a great example. Like, I was, I forced myself to learn RxJava on this project because, honestly, because a lot of people I respect were talking about how great it was making their lives. But I still, like, even now, like, having used it for six, seven months, I still don't quite understand every, you know, all the aspects. Um, and I'm constantly trying to figure out, like, 
it took me a while to figure out like what observable meant and what subscribing meant and what an action was. And I think that there's a big um, barrier to entry, but how many people just pulled in RxJava just because people are talking about it, you know, and not figuring out like, do you need to chain asynchronous operations or is a sync task or something else good enough? Or does retrofit callbacks do everything that you need? You know, it's, it's an interesting conversation to have, I think. And Greg honestly mentioned a really interesting point in that, like, I'm sure there's a wide ecosystem of amazing tools that reduce boilerplate I'm not aware of because, honestly, I kind of, I do exactly what you suggested. It, I usually follow Square because they're putting out, you know, and if Square puts, uh, that's Picasso that I used, started with that, and it wasn't until somebody mentioned Glide that I even considered it. You know, so, and honestly, I think Glide has succeeded because it followed Square's API almost exactly so that dropping Glide in in place of Picasso is extremely easy because the API is almost identical. I think that's uh, kind of been Google's uh, standard operating procedure is let Jake Horton come up with something. And, uh, <laughs> and they kind of copy that a little bit. And then Jake will you know, deprecate his stuff. Like, uh, for example, was the um, auto. auto. Oh, yeah. Was auto. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's just going to be an evolution. You know. Just, you know. Just uh, like you said, pick what you. Don't, don't worry about like chasing the newest thing. I think. Yeah. So. That's and honestly, that is something that's so dangerous. I think as developers, we tend to uh, want to use the shiniest, newest toy. So I don't know, and honestly, like I'm incredibly prone to that because I want to try the coolest, newest thing. And I think that's, that's a pretty common mindset for developers is, you know, if there's something that I can do to make the most amazing experience possible, I want to bring that in. But I think you find a lot of developers are in a, a state of perpetual rewrite because of that. Like there are developers I've met that never actually ship a product because they're constantly trying to figure out what is the latest thing. So my coping mechanism for that personally is like I limit myself to one new toy so every time I spin up a new project I'm like I get one toy to throw into this project and this time it's RX Java or this time it's butter knife or whatever you know so that kind of helps it also lowers the the risk that you take on as a developer that you can still ship and you still get to scratch that itch of trying something new at the same time so yeah I really appreciate the time. Feel free, like, I, I mean it if you guys want to come downtown and have lunch, you know, feel free. You know, I, uh, Chore Monster is kind of a cool place, you know, Ben will tell you. It's a nice, nice place to work. Um, and uh, I'd be glad to talk Android and nerd out with, with you guys at any point. So, yeah, any, any other questions? Nobody? Yay, thanks. Thank you.